Amen. 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 Well, I hate reading instructions. Anybody else? Like, you get something in the mail. Where are my guys at? They're like, dude, I don't got time for no darn instructions. I can figure it out. I'm going to wing it. And just this week, I was telling the, the marriage crew, my wife ordered this office chair. It came in, and I had limited time to put it together. She had this awesome dinner ready to go, and I had limited time. So, you know, like a typical dude, I don't, you know, I just rip open the box. I ain't got time for this, and I put, who's put office chairs together? I mean, come on, how hard is it, right? And I'm not the most mechanically inclined dude, you know, but I, I'm putting it all together, and no instructions, but in the middle of it, I'm like, dude, like, you know that mechanical thing you put on the bottom of the thing, and then you can, you know what I'm talking about? Like, and I didn't know how to put that on. I was like, oh, got to break down and look at the stupid instructions. So I did, thank God, because I was making it for my wife in her office. So, you know, you don't want the chair to be <laughs> like breaking in the middle of her sitting on it. You're the bad guy. And so I'm just not big on instructions. Let me get to it. I got time for that. Let me wing it. Um, also, I have a fear of printer ink cartridges. I'm just, can I, I'm just trying to be honest with you. I, and some of you guys, your closet, you get scared when you see your computer, right? And there's a the little icon and it, you're going to print something. It's like, I'm out of magenta. Like, what is magenta? <laughs> and it's like low. It's like, oh man, <laughs> I'm going to have to... Get on, you know, Amazon, and I don't want to spend the ton of money, so I'm going to go to the discount route, and then when it comes in, I don't know how to, I mean, I need, like, a PhD on how to put those darn cartridges in right. Am I the only one? Can, can someone else please humble themselves? Everybody else, you got to figure it out. And so I was actually really pleased. I cut it up. They know this about people, so this is the, on the box for the ink cartridge, can you guys get a good, like, I opened the box and they had the cliff note instruction on the box. I didn't have to fumble through trying to find the instructions. It was right there. Five. Five instructions. I'm going to be cooking again. The magenta is going to be full. I was reading this though. Number two, it was a run-on sentence. And I'm like, <laughs> unpack the new cartridge. Grasp both sides of the cartridge. Distribute the inside toner evenly by shaking, by gently shaking the cartridge back and forth. <laughs> I loved it and then I hated it. It's still sitting there, and I'm probably going to have to call Zion or Denise to come in and save me so I can print again. I'm being funny. But I think this is, why do I say that? Because that's how I did life for so many years, and still at times, I still try to do it that way. You see, the manufacturer, the creator of the chair, the, the ink, knows how it's going to work best, so he gives or she gives instructions on how it's going to work best. Did you know the creator of the universe, the creator of you and I, the creator of marriage, knows how it works, and he gave us this that you have in your hand as an instruction manual for life, and if we will just simply read it and apply it, guess what? Life can actually work. I'm going to tell you this. Marriage can actually work. You're like, no, not my marriage. Yes, your marriage. Yeah. Yes, my marriage. Yeah. I'll start with the original instruction. Speaking of marriage, Genesis 2.24. Can you throw that up? If you're a note taker, you can jot it down. Genesis 2.24. Therefore, I, I need you to see this. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his... Everybody in church, I need you to say it. Joined to his... Wife. Thank you. And they shall become one team, baby. This is Team Dachshund right here. Man, woman, God by his grace, he knows how this whole thing is going to work. 
he said, this is how it's gonna work best. So beautiful. Then a key component of marriage is sex. Yes, I said it in church. By the way, we don't have to tiptoe around this because God made it as a gift and this beautiful desire that he pre-programmed like air in your lungs, like you need to drink, like you need to eat. God wanted to populate the whole entire earth and continue to do it and bless you and I as male and female with this beautiful gift. We say it all the time. Sex is like fire, baby. You keep it in the fireplace. Hey, beautiful. You do it the way God instructed us. Oh, you throw it. Hey, I'm going to just write my own instructions. I'm not going to look at the manufacturers. I'm just going to make up my own instructions on how it should be, how I feel marriage should be, how I feel sex should be. And what happens? Tragically, the fire gets out of the fireplace and starts consuming the house. In fact, the neighborhood. You can sense a little bit that I'm passionate about this. Why am I so passionate? Because for years... I took God's instructions on sex and threw it out the window. I'm gonna do it my own way. That's what was happening in the city of Corinth. It was a sex-crazed city just like our culture today. You can't turn on the TV, social media, anywhere without the enemy selling sex outside of marriage as something that's gonna fulfill. And yes, it feels good, but after it, after it feels good, it actually starts frying everything. The context of this, the, these people in Corinth though are coming to Christ, many of you, coming to Christ and they have questions on this topic. And Paul gets after it and starts answering these questions in chapter seven. By the way, if you somehow missed it in your reading, please go back for homework and ask God to speak to you what he says throughout the entire scripture of chapter seven. Don't take my word for it. Denise's, Jeff and Shanti, take God's word for it. Let God speak to you. Paul answers questions in verse one. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now, regarding the questions you asked in your letter, it was wild in, in Corinth. They would actually have a temple to like Aphrodite, the sex god, it was a fertility god. And they'd have these temple prostitutes that would come down from the temple into the city at night as prostitutes. And the idea was if I went and slept with a prostitute from that temple, I would actually become fertile to actually have a family and many kids. What do we do here? Now I come to Christ, and now God says male and female, marriage for life, and that's how we enjoy this gift. He said, okay, let me address some of these questions. Yes, it's good to abstain from sexual relations, because they were like, dude, so we just become celibate now? He's like, actually, it's pretty good, but, verse two, everybody say, but. But, but because there is so much sexual immorality which I think the Greek is something like pornea, interesting. Sexual morality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. This is God's instructions from the manufacturer when it comes to sex. And as I mentioned, I grew up in church, I heard this, but I'm like, that's for lamos to really have a good time. Let me go sow my wild oats, let me be free, free sex. And I won't tell you all my story, but Denise and I want to be vulnerable and honest with you guys. I became sexual act, sexually active at age 15. At age 17, got a girl pregnant and helped pay for an abortion at age 17, your pastor. And so when people say, why are you so passionate about this? It's interesting. There's a scripture that says, those who've been forgiven much, love much. And you might want to just throw daggers at me and this and that. I know how much I've been forgiven by God. And I don't want another 17-year-old in our culture, in our community, to have to live what I have to live with. Yeah. And it's not just that. Broken hearts, 
things that we've had to deal with in our marriage for 23 years yeah. because of what I allowed to, the sex to get out of the fireplace and consume and burn. You can speak a little bit. Yeah, no, and I had the same story, just in a different state. So it, it was a lot of weight coming into marriage when we both have committed, a, not only committed fornication, but then, you know, sex before marriage, but then also both of us had consequences where we chose to participate in murder, ultimately. And then we had the weight of that carrying us into our marriage. And so two sinners under one roof with the weight of and the consequence of all of that emotional baggage was not pretty. And so... When you do marriage God's way, he, th that way doesn't have to be there. And we unfortunately didn't, and we had a lot going in. And so out for time's sake, we'll save those stories for maybe a podcast or something. I don't know. We'll see. I want you to notice this quote that says, the enemy will do everything he can to get you into bed before marriage and everything he can to keep you out of it after marriage. And... That was our case. Now, I can tell you, by the way, God's so gracious. In my truck, when he called me to repentance and I, and by God's grace said yes, he forgave me, he cleansed me, he gave me victory over lust and a, a strong commitment to say, God, I'm gonna do it your way from now on. Same thing that Denise said, and by God's grace, when we met, we agreed we wouldn't even kiss till we got on the altar on our wedding day. And God honored that commitment and we've been married for 23 years and have had a beautiful life when it comes to physical intimacy. So it can be redeemed, it can be redeemed. Now, we wanna continue on verse three. And Denise, is, this is the first of three points and we're gonna give a mini talk because I want to get Jeff and Shanti up here. But if you're, if you're a note taker, write this first point down. It's so good. She said, fulfill, don't kill. We're going to have, we have sexual needs, but let's fulfill each other's, don't kill. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 3. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. And the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. How many know that you're pre-programmed by God with sexual needs? Anybody? Just give me a raise of hands right here, right? And, but here's the tricky thing. We, Everybody's lot, needs are different. I was going to say, a lot of them didn't say yes. They thought that. Well, they were lying at that point. So, <laughs> now, unless you have the gift of celibacy, more power to you. It's great. What I'm trying to say is everybody's sexual desire or need or how God created you is different. And that's beautiful. It's beautiful. I was gonna ask you this, babe, like, what does it mean to you for me to fulfill your sexual needs? I love this question, but boy, is it loaded. Um, and he asked, can you give me an idea practically? And, and I just wanna take to light, and if you guys could put up the verse from New King James Version, it, it's, it shares it a little bit different. Ladies, tell me if you can relate to this. Say that sentence again. You want the question? No, yeah, the question again, sorry. What does it mean, babe? to fulfill your sexual needs. Ladies, does that sound good to you or does this sound good to you? Uh, same thing, same verse, different translation. It says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. Ladies, raise your hand if that sits a little better with you. Yeah. So start reading the new King James Version, <laughs> not the NLT. Well, because well, I don't think, I think a lot... It's really difficult because I can't even answer the question for me on a daily basis because I'm ever changing. And so guys, listen, I honestly believe that God created us crazy like that, that we don't even know ourselves and what we need so that you remain dependent on the Lord alone. Because here's the deal. If you're seeking God on behalf of your wife, Pray for me, in Jesus' name. Everybody extend the hand here L to Let me. me help. Let me just unpack this for a second. If you're seeking God genuinely on behalf of your wife when it comes to your sexual intimacy, God's gonna give you an approach with your wife that's beautiful. He's gonna help you to understand her mind, her heart, and her body, and what she needs to be fulfilled in these two first, and then physically will always follow. If you have her heart, her mind, and her heart, sex will follow right behind 
So have, have an understanding there's like this, and I always joke with him, and I said, sex starts in the kitchen, babe. You know, and so... Kitchen's cool with me. Well, there... <laughs> he, he got me this year. Last year, I got you. Okay, but that's for real, though. Like, there's an opportunity for us, and honestly... No, that's good. I honestly believe, guys, God built it this way so that you would be dependent and intimate with the Lord about your marriage. And so here's the deal. If you haven't been dependent with the Lord or dependent on the Lord about sexual intimacy, begin small. And it does feel awkward at first, praying before the marriage bed, getting it, you know, before uh, your wife runs off to work, pray for her, send her a text and tell her how much you love her. Little things like that, they build up and they bring crazy, crazy opportunities later on. It's so good. I wrote in my notes, if, and we learned this from you guys this weekend, the woman wants to know, am I lovely? Are we safe? And for, for men, reassuring your wife, reassuring. Even simple things, Dave talks about rubbing her back with no other, you know, there's no other sex connected to it. It's, it's affection, it's affirmation, it's I'm here, I got you throughout the day, little texts throughout the day. And you know, you've heard it. She's a crock pot, I'm a microwave. Like, understand that, and that's, that's, that's self-awareness, you know? I, I'm, I, I'm, a lot, most men, you know, the sexual need is release. Her, hers is reconnection and reassuring and that kind of release stuff. Release and relationship, and that's just building toward it. And a lot, you said ask for some practical examples, and again, I'm just apologizing on behalf of women in the room. Sometimes we don't know what we need. Sometimes it's a listening ear. Sometimes it's a heart connection. Sometimes it's a physical touch. And so if that's you and you relate to that, having those dialogues and that communication about what's your season, like if it's kids in the house versus not kids, it's different every season. And so understand that studying your wife will come so much more naturally if you're going vertical on her behalf. So good. You guys ready for number two? Number two, um, I wrote, give, don't get. And we'll be brief with this point. Verse four from 1 Corinthians 7. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband. And the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. And this is so key because I think in the Christian world, in the church, many times men have abused this verse and it's been completely taken out of context. It is not woman, what does Paul say? You, your body's mine. It, you know, we gotta be super, super careful and we need to repent of that. God, true, God is love. In fact, he's unconditional love. In fact, John three sixteen says, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. So what is this? It's not get over here, let me get mine. It is, I want to give my body away. I want to give my heart away to you, babe. My counselor, I would always ask him about this stuff because I'm like, I don't want her to feel like I'm, you know, like, woman, like, you know, I, like, I want to, but I, you know, I've got a need, and I, how do I do this? And he's like, he's like, here's what I do. When I'm ready, you know, and I'm feeling it, he's like, he'll go to his wife, I want to give all myself to you, babe. <laughs> he, he said that to me the other day. I just literally lost it. All, he just, I really did. I really, I was like, he's like Let's channeling my works. inner pastor Steve. And I'm like, come on. You're so funny. But I want to rewind because he's saying give, don't be willing to give and not just get. And it's so different for a male than a female in this. And I want to go back to fulfill and not kill. And this is just a pastoral confession here. I had seasons of my life where, if I'm really honest, I turned him down more times than I would like to admit for all these various excuses. And if we're really honest with ourselves, and that's really truly what's been going on, I did kill instead of fulfill, right? And, and what happens in a man's heart when we're constantly um, denying is there's just no desire for approach, right? And something happens in the man's heart about who they are. We were talking about it this weekend, and so I just want to apologize for those billions of times where I killed your desire to even come and approach me. And now I had to like flip and, and say, okay, Lord, can you fill me with the power to want to initiate? Jeff and Shanti are gonna get into that later because now he has no desire for me. 
right? And so there's this thing that can happen if I'm just not willing to yield to. And so when, I, when it says give, not get, there's a moment where we get to, as he mentioned, die to self like Jesus did for us. He literally died to heavenly glory. Heaven came to earth in an eight pound body Literally, I don't know how much he, it, to, to pay the penalty for your and my sin, but yet we can't kill what we're feeling in that moment and surrender in prayer. God, I'm really not feeling this. I want to learn to honor and respect and love. Can you please empower me? And that might start with dialogue, right? That might start with the mind and the heart before the body, but is there a willingness to at least yield to the conversation and see what the Lord would do with it? And I just wanna challenge every woman in here to really consider the conviction of the Holy Spirit and bring it before him and ask him, how would you have me walk in repentance and what does that look like? And so I wish that I could go back to a lot of seasons of my life and, and make a different and just have a different response than I did to what Holy Spirit was convicting me of. That's, you can't right? So now let's move forward with power and authority. So I really appreciate that. And I would just maybe lead us men, if we've ever taken the word of God and used it as very offensive to our wives, can we just repent of that? Like, if you want to just raise your hand, like I, like I've, I've, I've pulled that card in the past. God, no, no longer. I ask for forgiveness. I'm here to give, not get and serve my spouse and know that she's different in her desire might be different at different seasons than mine, and I want to be sensitive to that. Yeah, and when you have two people doing that, everything changes. Yeah, you're serving one yeah. another. Finally, number three, thrive, don't deprive, baby. Come on now. Everybody say thrive. I can authentically say I want God's best for your life in every area of your life. That's it. And that's why we bring the scriptures, because that's what God wants to do. He, he's got the original instructions and in 1 Corinthians 7, he's giving you three or four like cliff notes on the box. And this last one I like, don't, don't deprive, let's thrive. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Oh, it's all flowing, you hear that? Do not deprive each other from sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time. I like that so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. I, I kind of like fasting from sex every now and again because you can have sex as your God. No, God's my God. I'm satisfied in him and in him alone. Yeah. Now he's given me this drive and it, we, we, we are called to practice together in a committed relationship under God, right? But there's times you, you, you stop and you just fast and pray. But notice what it says. Afterward, you should come together. That's right. Come together again so that Satan... Did, did you catch Sorry, his my joke? Sorry, my bad, Did my you bad. catch okay. his joke? Keep, keep on going. So, we'll let you think on that King for James. a minute. Don't read the NLT. Sorry. You should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, let me just be super vulnerable and honest. There are men in this place, and there's women in this place. We're generalizing, but there's women that there has been over a limited amount of time. It's a God-given need. It's been suppressed. It's been neglected. Good-willed people get busy. They have a million kids. They're running people around. There's no connection at all, but the need doesn't go away. The desire doesn't go away. And I'm not saying that this is right, but both sides, they're not, those needs aren't being met. So what happens? They go outside of the marriage. That's why pornography is at an all-time high. If you go to like some pornography site or whatever, the woman or the guy, they're not saying, well, I'm not really feeling like it. They're looking at you going, let's go, desire. It's all satanic. And it's all outside the fireplace, but you're drawn to that because you're getting neglected. Or the dude in the office, right? It, there's this emotional that's connected to the sex, this the desire, 
and your dude is busy building his business and not emotionally connecting with you and flirting with you anymore, but homie Josh Rodrigo at the, at the, at the business site is like DMing you, you know, and hey, slacking you, hey, what do you think, you know? And there's this draw to that, and I, and I, it's, it's the enemy all the way. What does John 10, 10 say? We talk about this verse all the time. The enemy came to what? Steal, kill, and to destroy. Let's just say that one more time. The enemy came to steal, kill, and to destroy. If you destroy the marriage, you destroy the family. If you destroy the family, you destroy the community. If you destroy the community, you can kill the entire country. And listen, I, I'm so passionate about this because that is real. But you know how Jesus ends that phrase? But I came to give life, a rich and satisfying life. Ooh, in the fireplace. It's rich, satisfying. It is beautiful. It's beautiful. Do you want to, I want to go to the practical, but I want to give you space at this point for a minute or two. I want Jeff and Shanti to get up here, so. But the, the one thing I would just say to men, one thing I think is, is really, for women, I don't think that anybody in this room's intention is, I want to deprive you. I don't think that we walk, we wake up and think, let me deprive you, unless we've been really wounded, right? If there's a, a, a really deep wound that goes on, and so... I would just challenge the men in this room, if you're leading like Christ leads, women can't wait to submit to your authority. So I would just say, if, if we're having trouble in the bedroom, what's going on with your heart between you and the Lord? Because I don't think any woman's, like any good-willed woman is like, I'm choosing to deprive you. I don't think that that's the truth. I really just believe that if you're leading and loving her by being connected to the Father, she's gonna wanna run into your arms and trust you to lead her. And so I just feel like that's, really a, that's a challenge that you may um, just take on and pray about. I love that because we talk about Ephesians 5 when Paul said, he looks to us men first. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And if I'm allowing God to love my wife through me unconditionally, she feels so loved and secured and affirmed that there's not a lot of problem with that. But most often, I'll, I'll be the very first to admit, when we get disconnected, it's due to my pride or arrogance or busyness, it's me. I'm not loving her the way she needs to be loved. Me. Therefore, she's not responding the way I would want. And so I'll, I'm going to pause and invite you guys up right now, I think, because we can get into the initiate and participate. Jeff and Shanti, why don't you welcome them to the yeah. stage here? Yeah. Amazing. You can come over here, baby. You know, we, so having said all of that, there's some practical, yeah, that's fine. Do you guys need place for your, you guys are good? We're good. How about, by the way, you know, these guys are experts. They've, you know, written a ton of books. <laughs> they're um, researchers. They're absolute brainiacs. But what I found in the brief time, <laughs> he's like, you're pointing to your wife. <laughs> But what I found, even just last night, we had a chance to hang with them and Jim and Penny a bit, and uh, more, more than anything, authentic, passionate followers of Jesus that continue to get revelation from God and his word, and we see it on your face, <laughs> the joy of your salvation, and it's rare. Yeah. We got a privilege to be led in worship by Chris Tomlin recently, and I saw the oh, same wow. thing on his face where, you know, this beautiful passion hasn't waned, so we honor you on that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so, I mean, so it's, worth it. Clap. Easier said that is than all done. God. So, Jeff and Shanti, you guys are pros. Um, we're talking biblical truth, but you've just launched into some of the practical little things that you can adjust in your marriage that all of a sudden. There's huge change and huge blessings from it. I mean, is that, just let's start with that. I mean, what, if, what is one thing that you guys have seen in the area of little things changing? Well, I think it's all the stuff that, what you were saying, Denise, it's those, those things that show that I'm inclined toward her, that I am 
paying attention to her. I'm not just trying to solve a problem. I'm trying to show her how much I love her every day, to tell her that I'm choosing her all over again, that I'm glad I'm married to her. Now, a lot of the guys that we interviewed beforehand, before we started doing some of the research here, they were all about, can you just tell me what to do? <laughs> and, and the challenge was, a lot of these guys had the position that, you know, it's not happening as much as what I would like it to happen. And really just tell me how to make it happen for her. <laughs> and the interesting thing with the women is that they said, I don't know what it was yeah. that triggered me. Because one night, he's laughing with the kids as he's putting them to bed. By the time he comes to bed, I want him. <laughs> and so he's like, give me the easy bu button guy. So next night, I'm going to do the exact same thing. <laughs> doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And we said, why? She goes, I don't know. But you... But you pointed out something profound about that, which is that God doesn't want it to work that way. Right. So that you always have to learn your wife and be attentive yeah. and give, not get. That's right. Yeah. And marriage is really built to keep us, I mean, one another, one, but ultimately one with the Father. It's really a tool in his hand so that we're dependent on him to make this work, right? One of the keys that we learned from you guys this weekend, and I wanted to share with the whole church, was we're so wired differently, right? This sexual desire and yeah. how we connect and do you initiate, do you, you know? And uh, so I, I, what I wanted you to do, if you could, is let's get into like some, let's, let's see what everybody, where they're at. Take sure. out your phone, so are you take ready? take out your phone, and they're gonna throw up a QR code and I'd love for you to participate in this. Um, it's, you know, it's, what is this? It's not going to be tied to your name. How do you say that? No, it's, it's anonymous. anonymous. It's, it's totally anonymous. anonymous. No, so we're going to highlight out, you. Kevin Bailey thinks this. No. Yeah, it's anonymous. Yeah. It's not going to be that. What's good is we can get a picture kind of where people are at. And then, you know, I, I want to share something practical from Denise and I on how we learned to connect better in a very practical way, but maybe you can lead a little bit in this and well, set these up. Well, one of the things we should probably explain for those who weren't here is the sort of debunking the myth yeah. that, that yeah. we all have that's yeah. really getting in the way. When you talk about the enemy wanting to steal and kill and destroy, and I love the other quote, like that you said, the enemy will try to get you into bed before marriage and keep you out of bed after marriage. One of the, the things that, ways that he does that is by ha making us believe things and myths about how marriage or intimacy work that just aren't true and that are going to sabotage us. And one of those... And, and one of the reasons is because we don't know how to really talk about this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I learned most of what I knew about sex in high school. That was the only time we talked about it. And 14-year-old boys aren't usually the experts <laughs> on this type of information. And so one of the things that we all have to recognize, and I think this is, we, we don't have a poll on this one, but if we did, I would think honestly that probably 80 or 90% of us think there's just one way that sex works like and it's because we don't even talk about this topic even with our closest friends it's just us we don't know so the only thing that we have to go on is what we see on screen like on a tv show or a movie or maybe something you've read in in books and the the way that we think sex works is that what you see on the screen, which is that the, the, the man and the woman sort of look at each other, something's happened, and there's this feeling of desire, right? Like there's this spark of some kind, and they start kissing, and pretty soon the clothes are off and they're in bed. And it was kind of they had a surge of desire, and they did something about it. And that's sort of what we think it's just, that's the way it works. And so if it doesn't, work that way. We think we're either deficient or our spouse is deficient, that we're broken. That something's wrong. And the reality is, it turns out, what you see, like 
on the screen, that is one type of desire. It could be called initiating desire, but it's just one type. And there's actually two primary types of desire. And the second type is called receptive desire. And the person with receptive desire, which is, by the way, 55% of the population has receptive desire, and it's more likely to be women, not always. That's something that we should say right up front, is that they're about a quarter, about 24% of women, according to our nationally representative research on this, our, our surveys, 24% of women um, have more of that initiating desire. Um, but the person with receptive desire, they feel desire in the reverse order. And when they're, maybe their spouse is initiating or you know something's going on, they're choosing to get engaged with their spouse sexually. It's a, it's a, it's a choice of the mind. Their body is not feeling that same sense of chemical desire. And so they decide to get engaged knowing that it's gonna be good you know, in a few minutes and knowing that that desire is gonna kick in. But what's happening is that their body starts getting aroused and then assuming that this is, this is all by the way, assuming that this is positive, that this is a good-willed relationship, assuming that happens, then desire kicks in maybe even five to 10 minutes later. And they start feeling the sense of desire that perhaps their spouse felt from the very beginning. And it's so crucial for the person who has more the initiating desire to realize, oh, it's not that, you know, when I say, hey, baby, you want to jump into bed, and your spouse is like, well, I still have to finish that accounting report. Great. They'd rather have numbers than me. That feels really great. And it's like, no, it's literally just a different physiology created that way. And so you can work with it rather than wishing it was different or feeling like something is wrong. There's, there is, we should probably mention, there's also a third yeah. type of desire. It's a, a much, much smaller percentage, about, usually about 3 to 4% of men and 3 to 4% of women. You could call it resistant desire. And it's someone who has a fear, like a sort of a knee-jerk kind of fear of intimacy or resistance to it. It's like, you know, the parking brake is on in the car. Well, well can I give that quick little word picture? Yeah, go think for of, it. Think of this whole desire thing. You got initiating desire, receptive desire, and resistant um, desire. Think of it with an automobile. Your car is turned on. If you put your vehicle into drive but don't step on the gas, the car kind of gets still, pulled forward. There's it's still moving. something pulling it. That's initiating desire. That's what that's like. Receptive desire is the car is put in neutral. The car's running, but it's just not moving. Nothing, it's it not hasn't go, been activated. It's not been drawn It hasn't anywhere. been activated yet. And then yeah. resistant desire is the parking brake is on or it's in reverse. Yeah. And usually that resistant desire, it tends to mask other issues that probably should be addressed. Like maybe there's a real issue in the relationship or maybe there's significant pain, sexual pain. Yeah, That's a past. big issue. Or no, I'm talking physical, physical sexual pain, pain yeah. even both. Yeah. Trauma. And so usually if that's dealt with, that person is either initiating or receptive, mm -hmm. but at the moment... That needs to be addressed. Yeah. And I should point out, though, we were talking about the initiating desire, and you talked about how 54% of women have receptive. There is a significant number of 24 men. 24% of men. No, 24% of women are no, initiating. No, excuse me, 73% are initiating. 24% are, are uh, of men. Of men. No, sorry. 24, <laughs> sorry. Numbers. 24% of women are initiating. initiating. Correct. Thank you. As far as men, there is a percentage that are receptive. They're not all initiating. Well, and that's one thing I wanted to mention. We're talking about, like as you guys were talking, you're like, husbands, think about this. Wives, think about this. And so there's probably a quarter oh, of the funny, marriages yeah. in here where the wife is like, that's I don't funny. want him to deprive me, right. <laughs> you know, exactly. because of that. Yeah. So, can, speaking of which, can we poll Absolutely. the church on well, those three real quick, or is that possible to do that? Say it again. I think that's great. Say it again. 
this may not apply to everyone, right? Because you may not be in a marriage relationship, but it may or may not, you may or may not be able to participate. So if you'd like to participate, please do. Yeah, and if you're single, again, listen, I think for far too long in church, we haven't discussed this. So this is for you as well. As you then come into a God-ordained marriage relationship, we're trying to equip you as opposed to not. Hold on. So that's, that's part of it. So okay, Perfect. Can we do maybe pull up that question? Let's pull and, up. Or we the, can do a different one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the men to answer first. Okay. Um, and hopefully that'll pull up. Yep. So if so, you had the QR code, you may have that Slido. You would pick polls. Hopefully. Men. Yeah, pick polls. For men, different people men may only. experience <laughs> sexual desire or being in the mood at different stages of the process. Which is most true for you? Now, it could be that you're a little bit of both, right? So which is more true? I tend to be in the mood and want to pursue it. If my spouse initiates, I'm willing to try and eventually will be in the mood. If my spouse initiates, I'm willing to try, but I may not end up in the mood and I find myself resistant and I'm really not that willing to try. And so it looks like we've got, we still have a lot of people who haven't like chimed in yet, but it looks like we've got some pretty normal responses based on our nationally representative survey. It looks like about three out of four men are more the initiating. It looks like 20, if you add those up, it's about 23% are receptive, and statistically, that's more likely to be men as they get older as well, just so you know, that's also normal. And about 3% resistant of the men are resistant to sex. This is almost straight down the line of what we saw in the national studies. And so let's actually then um, go to the other poll. Um, Let's stop that one, and let's do the women's one. And that should come up, yes. Um, So same question, I tend to be in the mood, I want to pursue it with my spouse. If my spouse initiates, I'm willing to try. Um, I'm willing to try, I may not end up in the mood. Um, Or I find myself resistant to sex, I'm really not that willing to try. And so let's let the numbers, let's let more people chime in here. And um, we're still coming in. (laughs) Um, And so if you add up the two that are in the middle, those are the two receptive desire ones. So it looks like it's about the 74, 75%, just like the national survey, about uh, 20% initiating, about 6% resistance. So very, very similar to what we saw. We wrap our ego up in this all the time. And honestly, a big piece of it is just physiological. Yep. It's, oh it, is, it is so important for us to recognize, when you talk about that, the scriptures, about your, having your affection and about coming together again and recognizing that God has designed this to be this amazing opportunity for closeness And so often, these myths that we believe, the wrong information, is creating this opportunity for conflict instead. And so much of that heartache doesn't need to be there. So good. Love it. She has another slide. I know. There's a million, and we're running out of time. So let me me just give you one practical from our marriage. I I said that Denise and I would be very... um, TMI. I'm just forewarning you, TMI. Is it TMI? (laughs) We yeah, right. So, he, but I, here's the thing I care so much about this area because I've seen it destroy way too many lives and families. Yeah. So, if I can give you one tip that's helped us, then I'm willing to be vulnerable before you. And I'll give you the cliff notes. So, we, um, for whatever reason, for years, God's graced our area in this physical intimacy. It's just been beautiful. And then we got a little busy, hit a little rough patch, and we're disconnected a bit. And uh, we got, took some counsel from our friends, and they had what's called the GSD, which was the guaranteed sex day. So we tried to implement that into our weekly schedule. And, you know, it worked decently sometimes. But what ended up finding out is most often there would be times where uh, we both initiated at times, speaking of initiator. Uh, But there were some times, if I'm honest, where I wasn't real smart and I would initiate in bad timing. 
dudes, you've been there, right? Bad breath, you know, like she's, <laughs> she's tired, whatever. Like, bro, grow up. Like, but I, I, I'm thick, I'm a dude. So, but there would be times where she wouldn't respond right away where I would feel rejected. And I'd be like, dude, well, then I wouldn't want to go pursue because I don't want to risk rejection. And so what ended up happening is we, we, the beauty is my wife is so good at communication. We came to this place and we said, all right, let's, let's, let's change up a bit. Instead of one GSD a week, one guaranteed sex day, let's go to two. And one, I'm going to say I'll initiate and you'll participate. And then you'll, one time a week, you'll initiate and I'll gladly participate. <laughs> And this is, again, not forced, it's not coerced, it's not abuse. What is it? It's 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Do not deprive one another. Otherwise, the enemy will come and you will get out of control because of your lack of self-control. And this has been one practical tip that has helped tremendously in our life in this season. But Sweetheart, the, close us out well, with no, any but don't, don't you feel like the information that they just gave us is really helpful in not taking it personal? What do you guys think? Yeah, because it's really, it's so amazing that they, they invested so much of their time, treasure, literally, and their gifts to, to find these things out because they want to see marriages thrive. Speaking of marriages thrive, do you want to pick up that book? We should give it away, don't you think? <laughs> I oh, that's one let, of the only copies. Don't give it away. This. I know oh, you guys are out, okay. but oh. go to Amazon, please, as a couple. They just released this book, just literally. Just came out. Pick it up. And again, this is to, for the glory of God and to help you work through some issues, discuss it, be vulnerable, humble, not demanding, humble through it. Yeah. This is a beautiful work that will, I, I read the opening illustration. I was, I was dying, dude. It was great. If you just get the book for the opening illustration, it's going to be worth it. Let and me I just think say that. there's maybe like four or five copies left on the book table. Yeah, there's, so they can, have books out there that you yeah. would love to get your hands on for sure. Go check them out. Um, I feel like the, the key, if, if you would just put one word in today, do you guys, can you agree that humility might be it? Yeah, yeah like just a willingness to like humble ourselves before God and one another. And then ask, can this, this all happen and you know it all. Like you know all of our past and how many things have hurt us and how we've hurt one another. And some of you are thriving right now and you're like, I can't relate to this at all. Praise the Lord. But some, of, some people have had crazy things happen in their marriage and before their marriage that are attributing to some really difficult seasons. And so we just want to really learn to be vulnerable first with the Lord and then with one another, right? And just being tender toward any, any effort and not judgmental toward that effort because it's really easy for him to tell me his heart and for me to chop it up and throw it out. Mm. But really, that's a gift. Like, you're giving me what you feel like. It's, a, it's, per, it's their perceived reality. My perception is truly my reality. His perception is truly his reality, maybe different from one another. And so just being gentle and tender toward one another, that God can do miracles. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Can we give it up for Jeff and Shanti? Woo! Just honor Amen. them all weekend Thank long. You. Thank, Thank you, guys. I love you, guys. Amazing. So good.